So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the 25th uh, PyData Cambridge Meetup. Uh, and tonight we have uh, two talks. The first one is uh, Community Building Through Documentation that will be presented by uh, Melissa Weber Mendoza from Quantsite. Uh, and the second one is Optimizing Feature Engineering Pipelines with a Feature Engine by Soledad Gali from uh, training data. So uh, we plan to finish at uh, half past eight, but we might overrun a little bit. Now, uh, just as an introduction for the, our meetup, uh, we, are, uh, we started in 2018 and we are the uh, PyData Cambridge uh, local chapter for PyData. Uh, we have uh, four organizers, uh, that is Federico, Yoris, myself, uh, and Ole. We are all uh, here tonight. Uh, and uh, we are all volunteers organizing uh, this group. Now, as I said, we are uh, PyData, and PyData is part of uh, NumFocus. Um, in fact, uh, PyData is an educational program part of uh, NumFocus. NumFocus, if uh, that's your uh, first uh, meetup with us, NumFocus is a not-for-profit organization that supports open source uh, and educational initiatives. So you can see in the uh, list of projects on the left side of this slide, uh, many familiar names or familiar projects that you use uh, every day, and they are all uh, supported by NumFocus. We have uh, our code of conduct to abide uh, as uh, members of the meetup uh, and as uh, participants of the meetup. Uh, the, and the idea is uh, very simple. You can check the full code of conduct uh, on PyData's website, but the idea is uh, behave professionally and don't uh, treat others uh, in a way that you wouldn't want to be treated. Uh, yeah, so important to think to say is that uh, we have a code of conduct a response team, which is basically all organizers, plus uh, Leonie, who helps us uh, in dealing uh, with any reports that we might have. Uh, a few updates from us. So as it is the end of the year, and we usually do the meetup in the last Wednesday each month, uh, for the December one, we will anticipate it a little bit, so it will be the 16th. We already have a speaker, uh, and we'll be announcing it very soon, Prob probably this or next week. Uh, also talking about speakers, we are uh, at this point in the year composing our agenda for next year, so we need your help to uh, find more speakers. Uh, and or referrals of speakers if you don't want to uh, exactly volunteer uh, to talk or if you have a topic that you want to hear about uh, let us know uh, i'll say how in a moment uh, there is also pi giving which is a uh, campaign from uh, non focus uh, to raise awareness uh, to people about uh, donating for the for the open source and and, and their uh, calls. So this is open and you can check on uh, NumFocus website. Uh, we also, we have uh, four sponsors, which we are very proud. So that is ARM, Fetch AI, NumFocus, and Raspberry Pi. And we, are, uh, we have a few uh, updates from them. So from ARM, which is the company I work for, uh, we have uh, actually many open positions. So if you want to have a look on our website, so just a few to highlight the machine learning DevOps engineer that's uh, in the middle between data science uh, and DevOps uh, to make sure that everything works uh, in the infrastructure and uh, the data analysis part, uh, data engineer positions, all the way uh, if you want to uh, from creating machine learning frameworks and dealing with the internals of uh, the likes of TensorFlow and things uh, to data analysis uh, positions internal to, uh, to the company as well. 
So if you want to hear more about that, uh, you can talk to myself or Federico uh, and you can use uh, the Meetup websites uh, to reach out to us if you like, or you can use this chat on the Zoom call. From Raspberry Pi, our uh, second uh, sponsor, uh, they have uh, these uh, very cool streamings that they do uh, weekly uh, about uh, projects that uh, children or people in general actually can do uh, at home uh, using uh, Raspberry Pi to, to create cool things. So every week there is a new project uh, and you can uh, have a look on their uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation website. From our friends at uh, Fetch AI, they recently uh, launched a new project, uh, a smart cities project in uh, Munich. Uh, and uh, you can read more uh, about that uh, on, on Fetch AI's uh, website. So there are also some uh, other uh, test net that they call and uh, you also can uh, read about their uh, API to create uh, agents uh, on their website as well. Uh, as I said, we are uh, we are looking for we are always looking for speakers, but at this point in the year, we are uh, especially looking for speakers to compose our agenda for next year. So you can reach out to us uh, on Twitter or uh, via email as well. And that's that's all from me. Uh, I will uh, hand over now to Melissa. Uh, I guess you can uh, share your screen uh, and just uh, make a start. Thank you very much. Hey, I think I got it right. Can you see my screen right now? Everything working? Yes, I can. Yep. Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, hi. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Leandro. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm a fellow Brazilian like Leandro, but I'm, I'm, I'm based in Brazil. So uh, it's late afternoon here for me. Um, I appreciate that you're all here and I hope we don't have any other issues during the talk. And uh, feel free to say something or ask questions in the chat. Uh, I will also leave my Twitter handle and you can find me later if you want to uh, talk about uh, what I'm going to present. I'm going to talk about NumPy because it's a project that I've been involved with uh, for almost a year now. Um, so. I have been a Python user since 2006, um, approximately, and I was studying uh, mathematics. So I did my, my PhD in Belgium, working with applied math. And then I took an academic career, uh, went to be a professor at the university here in Brazil. But after almost 10 years at the university, I realized I was not happy <laughs> because I, I like software. and. I have always been involved with um, open source software, free software uh, communities, and I really like Python and I was starting to use Python more and more in my research and I wanted to get involved, but I didn't know exactly how and uh, it was hard for me to split my family life, work life, and then have like open source contributions on top of that uh, as a volunteer. So, um, I went to SciFi one year, uh, the conference in the US, and I met Ralph Gomers, who is uh, working at OneSite, and he mentioned that they had um, some job openings, and I applied, and now I'm working at OneSite. Uh, and, and some of my time goes to NumPy, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, changing careers at 38 years old is a bit challenging, but I, I do. Uh, I feel very happy right now. Uh, I've been working there since January. And I proposed this talk because I think it's interesting to explain what we've been doing at, at NumPy uh, as a project, but also trying to discuss 
these topics for other open source projects because I think they are important. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, community and linking all that work that we're doing in documentation and we would like to see uh, documentation improve our communities and how can we do that. And then I'm also going to talk more concretely about documentation, what we have been doing uh, in the documentation team for NumPy. And uh, we have a map, so I'm going to explain all that, what that means, uh, this documentation system that we've been using to organize our documentation and discuss some of the tools that we're um, experimenting with uh, to try and bring this documentation to people, but also to foster collaboration. So we want more people to contribute and we want people to bring their own experiences, but they need a way in if they wanna do that. So we are trying to experiment with different ways that people can contribute to the project. So uh, first of all, I want to talk about community because you cannot talk about an open source project without talking about the community because that's uh, what in the end makes the project and makes everything work. So I really like uh, John O'Bacon. He has a nice uh, quote that I brought here, which is uh, building a great community is fundamentally about creating an ecosystem in which people produce meaningful work are able to thrive, are motivated to keep growing, and can help sustain the future success of the community. Doing this well is all about understanding the drivers and motivations of people and using tech as a means to address and harness those drivers and motivations. Don't let tech dominate your thinking. And I think that's a really powerful quote because it means so in the Brazilian Python community, we have this, uh, it's like a motto for the community that says people are more important than technology. So it's all about the community and it's all about the people you bring to work with you and the technology will follow. If you have the best people around you and if, if people are happy and feeling motivated and feeling like they are part of a nice thing, they will contribute and they will bring their best to the project, to the community, uh, and to their work. So uh, this has been my experience in the Python community from the beginning, which is that people value each other and try to have each other's back. And in the Brazilian Python community, I've had uh, amazing experiences and I've made a bunch of friends. But in volunteer projects, it is complicated sometimes to create opportunities for new contributors. When you don't have a fixed idea of governance or a roadmap or a way to decide where your project is going and what you want to do with the project, it might end up being just a bunch of people working on the pieces that they find more interesting. So for example, you have a large open source project like NumPy people will choose to work on the things that are shiny, on the things that are, you know, uh, more exciting, but maintenance or, uh, I don't know, taking care of the CI and doing stuff like that is not as appealing to people. And so they may end up being neglected. And those are also important parts of the project. So when you create a community that is more diverse in terms of experiences, backgrounds, and the interests that people have, you help solve that problem because you create space for people to make contributions where they feel they are better um, fit to work on. So uh, for example, Python uh, had moved from a BDFL uh, benevolent dictator for life to a steering council, but there is some sort of governance. So people do discuss where things are going and where they want the language to be in the future and what kind of work needs to be done to get there. And for NumPy, we do have a, a, a steering council. There is a governance, but at the same time, there is not enough people working on the project to really diversify the kinds of contributions that people do. 
And I think that's a common problem because I've seen um, the same kinds of issues in other projects. And it, it is hard to, to solve when you have only volunteer positions. So you have to make that extra effort to create a, a, a space for people to come. Um, this is also related to the famous uh, circus sector, which is um, formerly called bus sector. Uh, which is the number that we say, you know, like for this project, how many people would it take, like if they decided to join the circus tomorrow, this would mean the project would die. And for some of the projects that sustain the whole PyData ecosystem, like NumPy, that number is pretty low. And, and that's scary <laughs> because if those people are not there, the projects will die or there will not be enough people to make the project move forward and uh, you know do maintenance work and create new features uh, that will eventually sustain all the rest of the stack and so it is important that we create a community that is ready to onboard new members and to accept new kinds of contributions So again, when you talk about open source communities, um, there is a few things that we need to be aware of. So for example, like I said, documentation is not the first thing that people choose to work on. Most people go uh, straight into code and that's okay, that's no problem, but we do need some people to be dedicated to documentation because it is important. It's important for people developing the code itself and it's also important for people to come into your project and documentation is usually the first encounter that people have with your project, right? And so it has to be pretty, it has to be organized and it has to have a purpose and a vision that lets people know what kind of project they are meeting and do they have enough information to decide to use this project or not? Um, are they feeling like the level of experience that they have is enough to understand the documentation for the project? So there are many important questions that sometimes are not asked at all. And, and I, I'm going to explain a little bit more about documentation later, but relating to communities, this might be a first barrier of entry, for example, for, for um, a new user or a new contributor, if they think the documentation is not good enough. So I, I'm definitely not an expert in code documentation, but I've been a teacher and I do like creating educational content and I do know the impact that it has on people. And as a former academic, I, I realized at some point that creating uh, papers that maybe one or two people are going to read, like the reviewers, <laughs> maybe not that many other people are going to read those papers, but educational content is going to impact the lives of many, many people. And especially in a project as large and as important as NumPy, uh, this is super, super um, high profile in the sense that people are going to look at, at the document several times um, and they are going to look for the official sources. And if they cannot find it, they will end up in the in internet. And, and then you can find like a bunch of tutorials, a bunch of explanations and, and other documents about NumPy, but maybe they will be outdated and then the user will try to do something, but they will get an error because it's meant to be used with Python 2 instead of Python 3. And those experiences might mean someone will choose another language over Python, for example. And so uh, these are things that we need to, to be mindful of. However, there is a problem. Um, open source communities are not as open as we would like them to be. Um, a 2017 GitHub survey with 5,500 users, I know that's not a lot, but it's what they had available to research. Uh, users and developers concluded that 95% of the people who responded were men, 3% were women, and 1% were non-binary. Uh, what does that mean? That means that something is not right. 
I would guess, because um, when you look at GitHub contributions and you look at who are the people who can actually contribute, they are people who have free time usually because it's really, really rare, rare for you to be hired to work on open source, to be paid to work on open source. And we know that historically marginalized groups are usually not the people who have the free time to contribute to those projects. So um, there, there are all sorts of problems with the GitHub files, and I, I'm sure you've heard this before. I have the picture of the GitHub files there, but you know, um, the metrics that we're using to count contributions are also uh, biased in a way. Uh, so it, it does, um, it fails to acknowledge the contributions of people who are doing important work on these projects. For example, when you do community work, when you organize a meetup, or when you do outreach, uh, when you do um, project management, uh, all those things are important contributions, but they are not uh, counted in your GitHub profile. So it ends up as some sort of invisible labor that is done by people in the community, but maybe not as acknowledged as the code work. And this is all turning people away from doing documentation, away from doing community organizing, away from doing project management. And that has an effect on the community because if no one is organizing the project, maybe the project doesn't have a roadmap. And that means people are not able to find a place to, contri to contribute because uh, there's no vision, there's no space left for people to come and have their own contributions uh, valued inside the projects. So uh, this is, for me, Coming from academia, this is a bit like uh, publisher parish, right? Which means that you have one way of contributing, one way of making a difference, and all the others don't matter. So for example, if you can publish a bunch of papers, but you're a bad teacher, no one will complain. Uh, maybe you, your students will complain, but not the university, not the academia itself. So some people might mention that funding might be a solution for this. I don't think we know yet. I think this is still an open question, but it's something that we have to be aware of if we want to create better projects and better communities. So in the same GitHub survey that I mentioned before, 93% of contributors reported that incomplete or outdated documentation is a problem. So we are all aware that documentation is not easy and that we should have more of it. But 60% of those uh, contributors said that they rarely or never contribute to documentation. It does not have the same status as code contributions and that is a fact. Uh, and many people see it as less technical and less important. And you can read more about this in the paper that I'm mentioning there. So this is a really cool article um, about the types, roles, and practices of documentation in data analytics, open source software libraries. It, it's a nice article discussing all those ideas that I'm mentioning here and a bit more. So if you want to have like an academic perspective, that's the one you should look at. So all of this can be put into the soft skills, um, which is not a term that I like a lot. I, I would prefer something like people skills, but at the same time, it is how many people know them. Um, and it does, many people think that these are, are skills that don't take a lot of knowledge to work on. So it's something like, oh, documentation is easy, so you can leave it for last. Or anyone can do it, so I'm not going to do it. And I, I'll leave that to uh, someone else to do it. So we are definitely missing um, perspectives, insights, and good ideas from our community because we are pushing these people out, people who could make contributions that are not code. So how does all that tie into documentation? So I've been talking about documentation, but more on the side of community. What can we do concretely about documentation in our own projects, 
so that the situation improves. First of all, let's think about what we call documentation. So I know for a fact that my husband works uh, also in, in, in technology, but in, in different contexts. And for him, documentation is mostly the API specification, right? So it's what we would call the doc strings. Uh, it's more like a technical explanation of what each function does. But that's not all, especially if you're considering an open source project, uh, you usually want to have some sort of narrative documentation. These are what we usually call tutorials, how to's, um, longer form explanations of how you did the thing you did in your project and why they, it is done that way and what are best practices for using your project and you know like quick start guides all of that those are effectively educational content um, documents so these educational contents can come in whatever media. So for example, uh, videos on YouTube, podcasts talking about your project and the, the communities around them, blog posts, all of those are also documentation, especially if they come from an, an official source inside the project. Um, live stream, now this is a new, uh, new, not, not exactly new, but many people are taking to Twitch and doing live coding sessions. I would also consider that documentation because many people will re refer to these videos later to understand how things are done. So you can definitely consider that documentation. Talks like the one that I'm doing now and, you know, like outreach in general, explaining how your project works, all of that. Um, GitHub comments, definitely documentation because people will look um, you know search Google for an issue or a problem and they will end up in a github uh, issue and they will read all the comments to understand what's happening and what they can do to uh, work around the problem so all of that can be considered documentation I, I forgot to put in there but also stack overflow whatever forums you consider for answering questions for example those are definitely documentation. So we need to understand that it's not just the little page that you put on your project that means documentation. It can be much broader than that. And many people will prefer different mediums and different kinds of documentation so they can understand um, the problem and the project better. So thinking about all that, um, like I mentioned before, I think this there's a, a nice movement around getting funding for open source. So people are realizing that uh, volunteer open source communities are great, but they don't solve all the problems that we need to solve in order to have like robust, reliable projects and sustainable uh, communities. So the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, which uh, sorry, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is uh, CDI, has um, a series of grants that they are giving to open source projects around uh, biomedicine. And NumPy received one of those grants last year. Um, and that was uh, basically geared towards maintenance, organizing the governance, our website, and the documentation. So I started working on the project because of this funding and I started working um, to create uh, the idea of uh, restructure the NumPy documentation and create a dedicated documentation team. Um, this is a very uncommon thing because most funding um, um, initiatives and, and uh, foundations and places that give you money to work on open source they explicitly disallow you to work on documentation or maintenance. They want you to do new features. And we all know that this is, is not necessarily good for a project. A project such as NumPy doesn't need that much new features, but it does need a lot of maintenance and organizing and community building. So uh, this is great. And we just uh, received news that we'll be getting a renewal. So 
for next year, we'll also be working on documentation because of this grant. And I think we should have more of that. So that's a great idea. Um, uh, because of that, we created a documentation team and we also did a map, which is the equivalent for NumPy of a PEP. So we have the Python enhancement proposal. We also have NumPy enhancement proposals. So this was called Map 44 about the restructure of NumPy documentation. So what is the restructure that we're talking about? We decided to follow the documentation system as outlined by Daniele Bertida and some people at Vivio, which is a company that does Django web applications. Um, they started uh, considering this idea of uh, splitting your documentation into four quadrants. So I'm going to explain a bit about the quadrants. Uh, I'm not gonna be super long. They do have a nice uh, website that you can visit at documentation.vvo.com and it will explain the whole documentation system. And it is what we're using for NumPy. It's not, not different at all. So the idea is that you will have uh, first the tutorials, which are learning oriented. So this means that you will create a document that will take your user by the hand from one place to the next and teach them something about your project in the process. So it's not necessarily the most efficient way of reaching uh, somewhere or the most uh, elegant way of solving a problem, but it is meant to teach a user about concepts, uh, important concepts and best practices for your project. So tutorials are the ones that take the most, uh, <laughs> the most work to write, I think because you have to be very mindful about doing things right and explaining in the right way and taking your user and not leaving any holes uh, in the reasoning so that they understand where they're going and why they are learning uh, what you're teaching them. Next, you have how-to guides. Those are 100% problem oriented. So you wanna solve something, here's how you do it. So you wanna open a file, this is how you do it. You wanna you know, create, invert um, N by N matrix, here's how you do it. So it's basically a series of steps, like a recipe that you can take um, to solve a specific problem. And then the user maybe can change the steps and solve a different related problem. But that's about it. Then you have explanations, which are for me the most difficult to understand but also some of the most important. So uh, these are understanding oriented. What does that mean? It means you're going to explain to your users why your project does the thing it does. And how did you come to this conclusion? Maybe historical uh, processes that made you uh, make those decisions. So for example, in NumPy explanation would be broadcasting, how does that work? And why was it chosen uh, as a strategy for, you know, operating on matrices on large arrays? And how do you store those arrays on disk and things like that? So it would be um, much more higher level of understanding and also um, maybe not necessary in every project because for some projects, you don't need to explain all that much. You just have simple um, how-tos and tutorials would be absolutely enough. Um, and last but not least, we have the reference, which is the one that we all know, which is the collection of doc strings for your, uh, your module, your library, your set of functions, and which is just explaining uh, which kinds of parameters you put in, what do you get out of each function, and, and how do you link those things together. Um, so it is pretty simple when you look at that, but at the same time, I can tell you that sometimes it's hard to classify documents in one or other <laughs> or another uh, quadrant. So we are still figuring this out on NumPy. For example, we have no uh, explicit explanations uh, because they are all mixed in with the reference. Because of historically, uh, those explanations were being done inside each function, so we didn't have a lot of separation for those concepts. But it does make sense and, and that's where we're going uh, for. 
So there was a longer explanation here, but I think I'm going to skip this because uh, you can see this is the same table that is on the document, the DVO website. So you can check it out there and it will explain a bit more about the types of documents. So what is good documentation? First, know your audience. You should understand who are your users and who are you writing to? Do you want to talk to your users? Do you want to talk to new contributors? Do you want to talk to your maintainers? Um, sometimes we don't have that clarity and the documents that we write end up being uh, missing the mark because we start talking to users but we end up talking to maintainers and, and they don't fit. So both users are going to be dissatisfied with the document. Um, it is easy and we all do it which is dividing documents between beginner, intermediate, and advanced, for example, if you're talking about tutorials. But sometimes it's easier to think about profiles or personas for your users. For example, maybe someone is not super um, familiar with um, NumPy arrays, but they are very familiar with MATLAB. Uh, so they do have an understanding of how to do indexing, they do understand how to do vectorization and all those high level operations, but maybe ju they just don't know the syntax. Would you call this person a beginner? I wouldn't. So maybe it's more interesting to think about personas and the profiles of people who come looking for your documentation so you can reach them uh, more directly with your narrative documentation. Of course, uh, it, it is always interesting to use inclusive language, so avoiding local uh, uh, sayings and, you know, like jargon and uh, slang, that's uh, important so that you can uh, reach more people when you write your documentation. If you can have translations, that is uh, ideal, but of course it's not easy, especially if you're in a volunteer open source project and make sure to review, update, and rewrite your documentation all the time because documentation also rocks. It's not just code. And you have to keep track of the documentation of your project. You can see that in NumPy, we are having uh, trouble updating the docs all the time because it, it's just so large and it's hard to keep track of. But it, it is important that you do. Um, finally, think about who writes the docs. So. I think it's easy to get beginners or newcomers to your project and direct them to documentation. Oh, you don't know anything about our project? Great, go write documentation. But is that the more appropriate solution? Because if you think about it, uh, maybe a, a person who is just arriving to your project doesn't have the appropriate insights to really explain what's going on and write about best practices. So. This should be, um, don't just direct all newcomers to your project to write documentation. <laughs> this is maybe not the best idea all the time. But it is a, a way uh, to enter the project if you do it right. So just to finish, um, this is um, one of the results of the documentation team is that we created a new repo called NumPy Tutorials. And in this repository, we are looking for um, contributions in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. So why did we do this? Um, the main documentation for NumPy is done in Sphinx, so using restructured tags. Um, many people who work with Python will be familiar with restructured tags and Sphinx, and will know that it can be very complicated for a new user, especially because you have to um, if you're building the documentation for NumPy, you have to kind of build the whole project locally. And that may be a barrier of entry if you just have like a good educational material and you want to add to the documentation, but you just don't know how to build and how to link, you know, open blasts and, and do all those complicated stuff. So we thought about allowing people to upload their Jupyter notebooks in a format that would be appropriate. However, we are having a lot of trouble with this. <laughs> Why? Because everybody uh, who has dealt with Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub and doing version control on them knows that this is not a solved problem. 
So we are trying to experiment with some tools to make this better. Uh, we, starting from MIST, so MIST is a, um, is a tool that allows you to write your Sphinx documentation, but in Markdown instead of using restructured text, which is what most people will be more familiar with. Um, there's a tool called, called MIST NB. So this allows you to connect Jupyter Notebooks um, and write your documentation and your notebooks in Markdown. And then a third tool called JupyText will do the conversion between Jupyter Notebooks and Markdown documents and will supposedly make it all work together. So this is still, we are still experimenting with those tools and I would appreciate if you have ideas or if you have uh, suggestions or if you, you want to discuss this a bit more or if you want to contribute, feel free to check the, the repo out. Uh, we are um, in the midst of organizing this tutorial and, and making sure the workflow works for everybody, but contributions are always welcome. That's it, that's what I had to say. So I'd like to hear uh, your comments and questions if you have them and please reach out. I'm on Twitter, I'm at Melissa WM and you can find me there you can send me a DM or mention me and we'll talk about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I guess we can use the, the chat functionality to submit questions. Uh, I can read them out to you. And as we wait for, for questions uh, in written form, I've, uh, I've got a couple questions uh, to start. And uh, the first one is uh, in the beginning of your talk, you were, you were discussing about diversity in open source projects. Do you, would you have kind of a one or two recommendations for open source projects? Because it seems that, that recently open source projects uh, Kind of woken up to this to this issue mm -hmm. and they want to have more diversity in the project but they struggle to to find people or when when somebody appears the they scare them out for some reason and and would you would you be able to point some things that you see on open source projects that uh would be helpful or wouldn't be so wrong so yeah, um, I think there's this whole issue, for example, I can speak about my own experience, I cannot speak about other uh, people, but from my own experience, it has always been really hard to find the free time to, to dedicate to open source projects because of many life issues. And I think that's true for a lot of people and, and many people end up not being able to contribute because they think they will have to dedicate too much time to it because it has like, for example, NumPy. NumPy can be intimidating and you might think there's like a very steep learning curve until you can really make a contribution. So what we're trying to do is uh, improve the communication and, and trying to be, so for example, one of the things that we're working on right now is mentoring inside the project. So we're trying to pair people with mentors and we are also experimenting with having office hours, uh, which is a period where one of the maintainers is there and, and newcomers can, can you know, join a Zoom conversation and ask questions or um, try to talk about stuff that they tried to do and couldn't do maybe. Uh, so I think it's a very hard problem to solve because of the volunteer aspect. But at the same time, we have to be aware that if people do come, they need to have the space to understand the project and to learn and to be able to make their contribution. And that means mentoring to me. Like, I think it's one of the best uh, actions we can take to improve uh, diversity. Of course, if people don't come in the first place, then you have to solve that problem first. Uh, which is getting people to know your project and to understand it and to realize that they can do their contribution. And I, I do believe that outreach is important for that. And that's why I'm here also, because having uh, the, 
having a way to meet the maintainers to to you know understand what they're doing and where you could fit your contribution is what makes people come to the project I think. but I, I don't think it's an easy answer and i don't think i have all the answers i think it's an experimentation at this point yeah sure and and i think uh the very fact that uh, some people don't see that they kind of represented in talks and things is also uh, uh, a contribution of uh, when you see somebody like looks like you on a talk it feels like more welcoming and yeah i think that's one more of the contributions uh, of your talk tonight so uh, let's see whether we got any other questions um, Yes, we got one. I'll read them out. I'll read it out to you. So, Melissa, do you have an advice for people that want to make a career change like you did from academic research to industry? That's a really hard question because it depends on your uh, your career path. In Brazil, things are very different, I think, from uh, the United States and Europe and I think many other places in the world because we when we get to the university, we take an exam. Uh, when you want to be a professor, you take an exam. And then once you pass the exam, you are a tenured professor. Uh, you will never lose your job. So deciding to leave such a stable job is hard. <laughs> so I think that it, it also depends on your context. It depends uh, how you face your own career and your own contributions. But for me, it was mostly, um, I wanted to have a larger impact, let's say. I wanted to be able to contribute more. I thought in the university, my contributions were so limited um, and that's why I wasn't happy with it. So what I did in terms of advice, I think it's being prepared. For example, I was in the university doing academic uh, scientific software, but I was studying about, you know, TDD, I was studying about uh, best practices for doing this or that, and I was studying other languages, Julia, um, Fortran, C, you know, so being ready for when the opportunity comes, I think it's the best advice you can get. So uh, I would say build your own uh, skill set and, and based on where you want to go, and if you think you want to leave academia, don't be stuck in the academia um, mindset, like go reach out and understand and come to these meetups. Uh, I, I would do this all the time. I would go talk to people from industry all the time to understand what, what do they need in industry? What would I need to know to get a job outside of academia? Those things are important. So build your own skill set um, and, and then you, you have the confidence, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question. Yep, I, I think that was very clear. Um, and I, I, I think we didn't get any other questions. So I have one to finish on the technical part of your talk regarding uh, specifically the documentation of uh, NumPy, which is, I mean, fundamental piece of the whole data science ecosystem. So I was thinking, uh, yeah, I, I use NumPy documentation very often. Uh, I find it very good, to be honest. Uh, I, I got a question that you, you mentioned that it is hard to link, or it was hard to maintain NumPy documentation because you didn't have the links between sources and documentation. Is this something that you, you in this new phase of NumPy documentation, are you trying to propose a solution for that as well? I don't know. Did I say that? I don't know. Because I think we do have, um, we do have links. So I, I don't know if you mean like, for example, if you, click on a function name, will you go to the source code? Is that what you're mentioning? So, I mean, if, if you have kind of a tutorial that mentions some parts of the code, that tutorial oh, right. will rot if the code changes. Is there kind of a cross-linking between sources or something? Yeah, there's no cross-linking, but if you do, for example, those tutorials that are in Jupyter Notebook format, they can be tested. 
So you can run a validation, uh, maybe GitHub action on them. And then you can see if the notebook runs all right. So if any of the commands fail because of an API change or something like that, or maybe something happens when a new version is released, the notebook will fail and then you'll know that you have to update the documentation. Right. So oh, yeah. for, okay. for those, it does work, yeah. For the other documentation in the website, for example, uh, I don't think, it, so we do have doc tests. So in a bunch of places, there are doc tests that will fail if you do an API change, for example. Um, and I think that's extremely important to do. Yeah, that's something I should have included in the talk. Yeah, you should, you should definitely, if you have the chance, you should validate using doc tests or using some sort of validation on, on large narrative documents like we are doing in the Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, for the rest of the audience, if you still have any question, uh, you can post it on the chat and I will read them out uh, after uh, Soledad's talk uh, in the, uh, before wrapping up the, the meetup for today. Yeah, thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so are you still staying in the, in the meetup? Yeah. Or, okay, cool. So let's uh, switch to the next talk. And uh, next talk is uh, from Soledad. Do you, so can you, yes. yeah, can you, sh you can share your screen. Um, yep. Yeah, I can see it. Can you see? Yes. Just my screen or do you see people here, Melissa? Do no, I need just to get rid of this? Oh, okay, just perfect. Screen. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation, the opportunity to share some of our work with you. Today, I want to talk about how we can optimize feature engineering and more broadly machine learning pipelines utilizing Python open source like NumPy. And in, for this talk in particular, Feature Engine, which is a, an open source project that we've developed. But before I jumped into the talk, I want to say a few words about who we are. So in training data, we are a group of data scientists and software engineers who have been working on researching, developing and putting in production machine learning models in various organizations. And throughout the years, we faced a number of challenges and we saw that there is a little bit of a gap between what you learn in uni or what you can learn in online courses and what you actually face in the real life. So after troubleshooting these challenges and finding some solutions, we decided that we wanted to close or narrow that gap. That's why we create several open source, no, several, well, we create open source packages like Feature Engine that smooth the deployment of machine learning pipelines and also make it more easy to work with data as we engineer our features together with data analysis. And we create a number of uh, courses that we can find online on feature engineering, feature selection, more broadly machine learning pipelines, and then how to put the models in production and how to test them after they are in production. So with this said, I want to mention very briefly that within organizations, we use machine learning to make predictions for a variety of things. For example, if we work in insurance, we can have machine learning models to predict the destiny of a claim. So when a claim comes in, say after a car accident, we can have a machine learning model that helps us decide who is at fault, if it is our customer, if it is the other person, and depending on who is at fault, the claim will follow a different path. If we work in insurance as well, or in finance, we create models to anticipate fraud and help us decide if a loan is asked by a genuine person or by someone that is impersonating someone else, or if when the accident takes place, if the claim is genuine or if it is, for example, exaggerated. We can also build models to predict credit risk. So if a person wants to take a loan, will they be able to repay the loan? So more important these days is the prediction of energy demand in particularly in the light of renewable energy. We also can build models for marketing and to determine better premiums for insurance as well and to predict customer churn. 
So as you can see, there is a variety of things, a variety of scenarios where we use machine learning models. And even though the scenarios are very different, they all have in common the fact that the data science team will try and gather data from various sources like databases, third party APIs or the cloud. And they will try to feed that data into machine learning models to try and obtain the predictions that will help the organization work better. Now, unfortunately, data is almost never suitable to be used in a machine learning model as it comes from the source. There are a number of things that we need to consider in terms of data formats and in dates of data quality. For example, very often our variables present missing data, which is that basically there is no information. And we cannot perform computations when we have no information. We need to transform this lack of a value into a number. Some data can also be in the form of categories or strings instead of numbers. For example, if we work in insurance, we will have the make of a car or we can have the city where the applicant lives. We could take values like Manchester, Bristol, Cambridge, and we cannot perform computations on those strings. Again, we need to transform those strings into numbers. Numerical variables will have certain distributions and sometimes those distributions are not convenient. Models will benefit if the distributions were more spread across the value range. In other cases, some of the variables may present outliers and some models are sensitive to outliers like linear regressions as we see here. The variables in our data are in different scales and there are many models that are sensitive to scales. So variables with bigger scales or bigger magnitudes will tend to dominate over the other variables. And this is true for many models like principal component analysis, linear and logistic regression, nearest neighbors, and also other models like support vector machines and neural networks will benefit of having the variables in the same scale. Some other data doesn't even come in the form of variables. They come in some other forms, like for example, text. And we need to be able to create some features from that text. Or for example, from images. We need to be able to extract some features from that images so that we can then perform computations over them. If we're working in retail, we will have, for example, transactions, where for one customer, we will have multiple data points at multiple times with various characteristics at each time point. We can also have geolocation data. We can have time series, like for example, the energy consumption pattern of a household. And then we can also have date variables and time variables. And we can certainly not use this raw data as it is. In fact, we need to transform the data quite extensively to remove missing data, to, remo to encode variables that are categorical into numbers, to modify distributions, to modify scales, but also to extract features from text, from images, from date and time, or to create new features from transactions, or to flatten a time series into some static features, or to convert some sort of distances, for example, from geolocation data. So there's a lot that needs to be done with the data that we have in order to be able to, mean, to build useful models. So at the end of the day, a machine learning pipeline looks more or less like this that we see here, where there is the first stage where we can, we have to gather the data to take it to the space where the scientists are going to work. Then there is a stage of feature engineering where we transform our variables, we create new features, then we train the model, and then we need to be able to score new data to obtain the predictions that we're going to serve to some other system of our company or organization. Now in the feature engineering stage, we saw that there is a lot that we need to do. We need to carry out missing data imputation, categorical encoding. We can sort our variables into bins in a process called discretization. We can transform distributions. We can create new features. We can combine new features. And this means that there is a lot to code to obtain all this information from our raw data. 
When we train our model, we can train a variety of models. For example, we can use linear models, so we can use decision trees, we can use nearest neighbors, support vector machines, neural networks. We can also build several models and stack them all together and then make a decision that is actually composed by the collective decisions of many models. This means that there is a lot of parameters that we need to adjust and save, and this challenges reproducibility. And we'll see in a minute reproducibility between what? In the scoring layer, what needs to happen is that we're going to receive one new observation or maybe one whole batch of new observations, and this data is going to be in the raw format. So we need to carry out the entire pipeline of feature transformations to remove the missing data, to encode categorical variables, to transform the variables, create new features, etc. And once we finish the pipeline of transformations, only then we are ready to give that data into the model to obtain the prediction. This means that we need to save all the intermediate parameters from the feature engineering pipeline and from the machine learning model so that we can retrieve them at a later stage so we can modify the new data to obtain the prediction. So in essence, we need to save the entire pipeline. When we research and build our models in the research environment, we usually do it in Jupyter Notebooks. And if we're not very mindful about it, we tend to take the data, divide it into the train set, test set, maybe one whole that sample, and then we build our entire code based on these three data sets. The problem is that almost certainly when we have our best model and we present it to the company, someone from the organization is going to come and say, can you actually score this batch of customers from last month? I want to see how the model is doing in recent data. And at this point, you don't want to see yourself in a position where you say, um, actually, I can't because my Jupyter notebook is only tailored to process the train, the test and the holdout. I cannot accommodate yours. We need to develop the code in a way that will allow us to score pretty much whatever we are asked to score. And finally, when we deploy the model, we're not going to deploy Jupyter notebooks. We're going to transform this code into production code, into Python scripts, wrap it into a package or an API that then we can deploy. So this means that we're going to basically have to rewrite everything that we have in the Jupyter notebook in a way that is suitable for production. And we are also going to have to include tests which are often overlooked when we are developing our code in the Jupyter Notebook. And when we do this, we're going to face a lot of challenges in reproducibility. Reproducibility is between the research environment and the production environment. What we want to happen is that the model that we built in our Jupyter Notebook is identical pretty much to the model that we have in production because we investigated the benefits of the model and the model performance in the Jupyter Notebook. So if that doesn't hold out into production, then we cannot guarantee that the benefit that we saw is going to hold on. So if we have to do this, we have to rewrite code and include unit tests. There is actually a very big overhead between research and production. So like putting a model in production, it takes a lot of time if you have to rewrite this. But fortunately, if we use open source, we can minimize the amount of time that we take to put our models in production and also maximize reproducibility. So going back to this slide, unless we build very specific models to suit a particular problem that we have within an organization, almost always we're going to use scikit-learn because it's there, because it's well-developed, well-tested, well-documented, it's, it's perfect. So most often than not, we build our models utilizing scikit-learn or if we're building some neural networks, we also use Keras because it's a wrapper that basically wraps the neural networks so that they have also the fit and predict functionality. Now, in the last years, 
there's also been developed a lot of open source packages that capture the feature engineering part. So in particular, scikit-learn has extended dramatically its functionality to so that it allows us to perform a lot of the data transformation techniques that we need to use in order to make our data suitable for machine learning models. But there are other packets, packages like category encoders and feature engine that is the one that we developed. The beauty of using open source and particularly these packages that I show here is that because they all share the fit transform, fit predict functionality that was designed in scikit-learn, we can accommodate all the transformations within a pipeline. And I'm going to mention what the pipeline is in a minute. But basically, we are going to put all the transformations and the model in one object that then we can save to make the predictions. And when we deploy our model, when we pass from the Jupyter notebook to the production code to develop the API, the only thing that we need to do is just push or copy or translate the code from the notebook to the API. But because everything is wrapped in one pico, this aspect is very simple and straightforward. So utilizing open source makes our life very easy because first of all, it reduces the amount of coding that we need. Why? Because all the functionality is already captured by the project. The only thing that we need to do is to call their transformers or their estimators and apply them on our data. Second, because we can accommodate all the functionality within one single file or pipeline, then we can use just this one file to score every application that comes in the future. Packages are naturally controlled and versioned, so we know exactly what is in each of the versions. So if we developed a model in one version of the package, then we can deploy that particular version to maximize reproducibility. We are deploying the same code. And the packages include a lot of tests for their functionality. So that means that we don't need to test in production because the transformers are already tested. The only thing that we need to be careful is that the pipeline is working as intended from end to end. So as you can see, this utilizing open source reduces the amount of work that we need to do quite dramatically, improves or optimizes the deployment times, and makes our life very easy. And for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on this particular aspect of utilizing open source, that is that it allows us to build just one file with all the functionality. Continuing to talk about these three packages, they all contain the fit transform functionality that was originally developed by scikit-learn and is very widely adopted by the community. So every package that comes now to the market takes the fit transform functionality. So it makes it for users much easier to learn how to use and to integrate within their working pipelines. With the fit method, what the transformers from these libraries do is learn the parameters. And there are a lot of parameters that need to be learned when we train an algorithm, but there are also a lot of parameters that we need to learn when we apply feature transformations. Because we need to learn, for example, means or medians or modes for imputation. We need to learn mappings from strings to numbers. We need to learn, for example, mathematical modifications that we're going to apply to the variables. We need to learn how to combine the text in order to create features. So all of these things we usually learn from the training set and then those parameters are stored and with the transform method we recall those parameters and transform all the incoming data that we have later on. Because of this fit and transform functionality what this means is that we can accommodate all the feature transformations within the scikit-learn pipeline. The pipeline is a class that does something that is very simple. It just applies one transformation after the other. So the only thing that the pipeline does is to take every transformer that it has within it and apply it one after the other on the same data. So this way, if we're using, for example, feature engine, we can have a first step what we have, for example, the missing 
where we add a binary indicator for missing variables. And here we can specify that we want to add an indicator for variables one and variable two. Then in the second step, we want to perform median imputation only of the variables that we see here. In the third step, we want to impute categorical variables with, for example, one string missing. So we use another transformer from feature engine and we indicate which variables we want to modify. Then maybe we want to discretize some of the numerical variables in our data set. Maybe we want to cap the outliers in some other variables. We want to perform logarithmic transformation of some other variables. We can combine features, for example, by adding them all together into new variables. You see how this goes. So we can add as many transformations as we want within this data to get our, with this pipeline to get our data ready. And at the end, we can also include a machine learning algorithm, in this case, a lasso regression, that will take in the data that was raw at the beginning of the pipeline, but completely pre-processed just after being fed into the lasso, which can now pre-process this data to produce a prediction. Once we assemble all the transformations within the pipeline, we only need to apply the fit method utilizing the training set. And the pipeline is going to activate the fit method in all the transformers within it, one after the other, so that it learns the parameters, transforms the data so that it can pass the transform data to the next transformer, which will now learn the parameters, transform the data and pass it on to the next one and so on. So after fit, all the transformers within the pipeline have learned all the parameters that they need in order to pre-process the data. And also by the end of it, the lasso regression was fit on the data that was completely transformed. And the beauty of this pipeline is that we can store it all together in one people. So when someone from the organization comes last minute and says, can you score the customers from last month? Now you can say, actually, yes, I can. You load the people and you just score the data. Later on, once the pipeline is completely fit with the method predict, we can make predictions over pretty much every data set that we have. We take in the raw data, in this case, the training set, and make the predictions. Then we take in a raw test set and make some predictions. And like this, we can take in pretty much every data, including live data once our API is live, and make the predictions. So I mentioned that these three libraries support functionality for feature engineering. What specifically do they support? Scikit-learn has quite an extensive battery of transformations for missing data. So it supports mean, median, mode, and arbitrary imputation. It supports one hot encoding and replacing the categories by number. It supports three ways of discretization. It supports pretty much every mathematical transformation that the user wants to do on the variables. And it can combine features by polynomial expansion, for example. Scikit-learn also allows us to create features from text and it has several transformers to select the more important features or predictive features from our data set. The two things that are not my favorite from Scikit-learn are the fact that it transforms the entire data set. So you need additional code if you want to transform just a group of variables and not the entire data set, and that it returns NumPy arrays. So I tend to miss the column names after using scikit-learn transformers. Feature Engine has also an extensive variety of transformations for missing data imputation. It also has many techniques to transform the strings of categorical variables into numbers. It has the mainstream discretization techniques and some fancy techniques like discretizing using decision trees. It can also transform data, but very specific transformations that I'm going to name in a minute. It allows us to combine features with several mathematical combinations like product, mean, average, sum, etc. From version one, which is going to be released in two weeks, is also going to support feature selection. And it also has a wrapper about scikit-learn that allows us to apply pretty much everything transformation that we can find in scikit-learn, but only in a selective group of variables. Um, 
category encoders, as the name indicates, it contains transformers for categorical variables. So it has the most exhaustive battery of categorical variable transformations that are very useful, I think, for organizations and also for data science competitions. So I encourage you to go and have a look. I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on Feature Engine. Feature Engine has its dedicated website. It has extensive documentation in utilizing read the docs, and also it has a, a GitHub uh, repo. It can be installed using pip install feature engine, and it's also available through Conda. As I said, it takes in a pandas data frame and it returns a pandas data frame. This makes the transformations carried out by feature engine suitable also both for data analysis and deployment for data analysis because it returns data frames which have variable names and also can leverage all the power of visualization that pandas provides and for deployments because we can integrate it into the pipeline and then deploy just one pico. I've mentioned already more or less the data transformations that we can apply with feature engine for missing data imputation which can perform imputation with the mean the median with an arbitrary value or we can automate the the search for the arbitrary value at the ends of the distribution with a transformer that is called end of tail for categorical variables, we can perform mode imputation or frequent category imputation or we can replace the missing value with any string that we like, for example, missing. We can add binary indicators for missing values, like one or zeros indicating if the value is missing or not. And it also performs random sample imputation, which means that it will extract samples at random from the training set to fill the missing values in the test that we want to, in the data that we want to transform. For categorical encoding, Feature Engine supports one-hot encoding and also supports one-hot encoding on only the frequent categories. This is very useful when we have rare data in, because it is very common that when we score new data, we find categories that we didn't find in the training set. So we need to do something with that. If we already contemplated this by top one hot encoding only the top categories, then this is automatically handled. We can also replace categories by the count of observations per category or the frequency of observations per category. We can replace categories by numbers arbitrarily or in a way that is ordered following the mean of the target so that the category with the smallest number, say zero, has the highest mean of the target and the category with the highest number has the smallest mean of the target. We can also perform mean encoding, which is basically replacing the category by the mean of the target. We can perform weight of evidence that was originally designed for its use in finance, particularly with decision trees, uh, sorry, with logistic regression. And we can also perform some fancy encoding utilizing decision trees so that the decision tree will make predictions utilizing the strings and then replace the categories by the predictions of this decision tree. Feature Engine allows us to group rare labels into one umbrella term that we can call rare or other. This is also helpful when we put our models into production because very often there is data in the live data that was not present in the time set. So then this data that is new for the model will automatically be recoded as rare and then the model knows how to handle it. Feature Engine supports a number of mathematical transformations like logarithmic, exponential, reciprocal, Box Cox, and Yeo Johnson. And it also supports discretization in intervals of equal width, equal frequency, arbitrary, designed by the user. And it also supports discretization with decision trees, which was a technique developed in a KDD competition of 2009. If our data has outliers and our models are not friends of outliers, we can cap our outliers or we can actually remove them from the data set and we can define outliers using various techniques. For example, if it is normally distributed, we can use the mean plus minus the standard deviation. If it's skewed, we can use the interquantile range proximity rule. We can use percentiles or we can also cap it at the number that we think is the one. Feature Engine allows us to combine variables, for example, just to see how this is useful. If we're working in finance, we 
can combine the total debt of a person with the income to obtain another variable that is called the debt to income ratio. So here we have a ratio. If a customer has debt over different credit cards, we can sum the debt and obtain the total debt. Or we can have the income minus the expenses to obtain the disposable income. So these variables don't come as such in the data set. We need to create them. We can create them with feature engine utilizing the mathematical combinator, indicating which variables we want to combine, how we want to combine them, and what's the name that we want to give to the new variable. And then with transform, we perform the transformation. In the coming months, we're going to have um, functionality to work as well with daytime variables. So date and time variables cannot be used as such. We extract a lot of information from them, like for example, day, month, semester, year, quarter, hour, minute, second, but more importantly, we combine two time variables to determine time elapsed between things. For example, if a customer makes an application and I have the date of birth, I can determine the age of the customer. Some other functionality that we hope to have soon in the package is how to create very quick features from text, like counting characters, words, unique words, lexical diversity, and how to count paragraphs and sentences. And as lastly, we are welcoming contributors. So over these years, we have had an, a growing number of contributors that have come and added new functionality to this feature engine. And we would also love you to have you on board. So that's all from me. I'm sorry if it was a bit rushed, but I'm mindful that we are very short of time. So if you have any questions. Um. Thank you very much for the talk, Silva. Um, I guess, so if somebody from audience wants to type a question, uh, just type the question in the sh chat and I will read it out. Uh, and in the meantime, I got, uh, I got two questions uh, for myself. Uh, the first one is, uh, so you spoke a lot about uh, data imputation, which I understand oh, from what I understood is to kind of fill gaps on your data set. And yes. I, I just got curious then, to what extent when you, when you create those artificial values, they, they risk kind of uh, poisoning your data set or something like that? And how do you decide between one imputation technique or the other? Yes, that's actually a very good question. I think it depends on a number of things. The first thing is which model you want to build, because if you want to build decision trees, they are quite robust to having a number that has nothing to do with the rest of the distribution. So perhaps choosing the te imputation technique is not so important as when you're building linear models, because linear models are more sensitive to the distribution. So as general guidance, when we're building linear models, I think we want to preserve the distribution of the variable as much as possible. So we want to perform, we want to impute with parameters that are intrinsic to the variable distribution, like the mean, the median, or ideally random sampling. It also depends on how much, how many missing values you have in your variable. If your variable has few missing values, then the distortion is not going to be huge. If you have a lot of missing values, then the distortion is going to be quite dramatic. So I think you have to play a little bit with that, with which model you're building, how many missing values you have, is the model robust to variable distortion? I don't know if that answers the question, I think. Yes, it's... yes, sure. Um, then uh, a follow-up question is uh, when you were talking about a feature combination, then uh, that from what I understood, you is uh, creating uh, fields that, that will be useful on your data set that might be a combination of an expression on, on the other fields. I, I just got curious, if you have a massive data set, do you have any measurements on, on, on performance of those functions to see that uh, how long it take to, to apply on a large data set? Um, that's something that we still need to do to measure like time and performance. Because we're using pandas and NumPy, it shouldn't be dramatically. I mean, it would be as much as those two libraries take. Um, I think the more 
specific question, perhaps if I understand this correctly, is that when we have a large data set, how do we know which variables to combine? If we're doing a data science competition, we probably don't care and we just combine everything with everything because we just want to win. But when we work within an organization, we don't do that because we need to explain what we produce and why we make the decisions. So the variables that we create, they have some sort of business meaning. So we create variables like, for example, debt to income ratio. If I have an accident, a car with an accident, I can sum all the parts of the car that had an accident to get a picture of the total damage, for example. But I wouldn't sum variables just for the sake of summing variables. So there is a bit of domain knowledge that you have to have to decide how you're going to combine the variables, regardless of how big the data set is. And because of this, we normally don't work alone. There is always a risk team very familiar with the data. There is an insurance team familiar with the data. So we get a lot of input about what are the most meaningful variables or the variables that the business will need or want. I don't know if that answers. Yes, and uh, just out of curiosity, is that something, so when you have a combined variable, is that something that physically exists or when you ask for that field, the framework will process that and return that value to you? When we combine variables? Yes. Um, the way the transformer is implemented, you indicate which variables you want to combine, you indicate the operation that you want to perform, and then you have the option to give the new variables a name. Right. So it will return the original data set plus the new variables. And if you gave them a name, it will be combined right. under that variable name. If not, it will so just have the variables name combined. That's something materialized into the data set. It's not yes. a function that exists at API level and process uh, on the fly when you ask. If you... No, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, it will become as a result. So you will have your data with the additional variables because the whole thing is that it needs to be able to work within the pipeline so that that data set can be taken in by the next transformation or by the model. So we need the results. Right, yeah, understood. So let me check. Uh, so there is one more. So. Since you mentioned that you are looking for contribute, contributors to Feature Engine, uh, where should people look for developer guides on how to get started? There are a number of ways that you can reach out to us. Uh, the first one is the GitHub repo. It has an issues section with a number of issues that we're working on. So if one of them is of interesting for you, you can just put your name down to the issue, start the conversation, that's one way. The other thing is that you can contact me through LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, or then if you look in the feature engine documentation, there is also guidelines of how to contribute. So it's very easy, like just give me a shout. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very much uh, for uh, making yourself available to give us a talk today. Uh, I would also would like to thank Melissa for taking the time. Uh, and that's basically the wrap up for our session today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we will have another session in uh, about uh, two weeks time. You are all invited uh, and we will be uh, releasing more information so soon. So, uh, Thanks again, uh, Soledad, Melissa, and for everybody else, uh, see you soon. Thank you very much and bye-bye.